Welcome to We Chats with Brilliant People, hosted by Dr. Allison Rodius, Professor of Sports Psychology at John F. Kennedy University. In each episode, Allison talks to highly successful people in music, sport, and the boardroom. She digs into the mental training techniques that they use to ride out the waves that challenge them in work and in life. So enjoy these wee chats with brilliant people. Welcome back to We Chats, everybody. Today I am super excited to talk to Adonal Foyle. For those of you who know anything about basketball, you will know that Adonal used to be an NBA superstar. I'm going to call you a superstar. Uh, you are, you always are in my eyes. Um, Adonal is also a community ambassador for the Warriors, Golden State Warriors here in Oakland. And he used to be one of my students. <laughs> so I know Adonal pretty well. And he is also an author of a book. So welcome to We Chats, Adonal. Thank you for having me. Um, so for the benefit of the listeners who uh, don't know, let's say they don't know anything about basketball, um, some of them may not. Can you just give us a little bit of information about you? Yeah, you know, I grew up uh, in the Caribbean uh, on an island called St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I played uh, college ball at Colgate University, and then I got uh, drafted uh, by the Golden State Warriors. I spent 10 years there, and then I um, spent uh, three years in Orlando, and uh, then I retired. Um, I've always kind of been really in love with the game of basketball, I mm. think, in terms of uh you're playing at the highest level and coming from where where I did, uh, I think the island I grew up on is called Canawan. is about five hundred people. So to wow. <laughs> so to come to the United States, I remember my first high school in the states. We probably had about three thousand people in the high school. I caught my heart. Talk about culture shock, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's been an extraordinary ride. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it yeah. sounds like it. So so now what do you do for the Warriors? Uh, you know, so as a community ambassador uh, of the team, I go out a lot in the community and really spend a lot of time um, bringing uh, different issues to the forefront in terms of uh, organizationally. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in many ways, I'm the face of the organization in the community. Mm -hmm. So we, we go out and we talk to, we help, help a lot of schools, um, uh, we offer scholarship for different opportunities. We go out and um, just support different organizational mission in the in the in the community, and um, just being a face there and bringing um, kind of a, a, a delight to some of this great work that is being done by people in our community. Hmm. Yeah, it's an important job. I absolutely love it. I mean, I, I I've done it uh, throughout my career with both my organization. Uh, the Kerosene Lamb Foundation and Democracy Matters, and it just seemed like a natural fit in terms of uh, continuing to, you know, to promote the missions of different uh, avenues. But also, I get an opportunity to be out in the field and talking to young people and really um, getting a sense of their aspiration and some of the things they want to do with their lives. And you know, insofar as we can help make some of those things better, it, it's it's a truly uh, amazing opportunity. Mm -hmm. yeah. That that's great. Um, so you know that we chats is all about um, you know the the performance psychology aspect, the sports psychology aspect, um, and and focusing on what do people do in terms of their own mental preparation for performances and also life. You know mm -hmm. how do you ride the waves is something that I a, a phrase that I always like to ask. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe take. I can take you back to your playing career mm -hmm. um, and just let's just tap into that a little bit about what kind of mental preparation strategies did you like to use? Well, I think, you know, for me, I wish I kind of like knew more as a high school player. I mean, there is a certain things as an athlete that over your playing career, you come to kind of realize certain things and it's usually by accident, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I remember... Um, one of the things that was difficult for me, I played at a very high energy pace. And like, 
it didn't matter what was happening. You can have these kind of lulls, like where you feel like your body is not doing what you want it to do. Mm. And I remember, you know, I just decided that, okay, I need to listen to Caribbean music, really high up tempo <laughs> music, right? And I'll be in my car on the way to the game. And I mean, I'll be just blasting music. And, you know, it, 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 I realized that it really got me to that place I needed to be to prepare. Mm -hmm. And then um, later on in my career, so I, that has always... And that was when you were in high school. That was when I was in high school. Right. So, and then I, when I got into college, I started really using it a lot more. It became a part of like really um, isolating myself a little bit, start wearing headphones, really start listening to different kind of music, depends on where I felt my body was. So I became very in tune with my body intuitively that... Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm really excited because the moment the game was bigger than uh, than than normal, so I, I didn't really need a lot of stimulation to get to that level. But if you know, if I was not feeling as 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 pumped as I needed to be, I I started you know I put on some um, some really fast tempo music. But if I was feeling really high, I listened to some mellow music to bring me back mm. down. So I started like doing that, you know, naturally, and um, you know it was it really worked well for me. And then. You know, I, when I got into the league uh, my first year, it, it was very difficult. I had a really major injury in which I was out for quite a bit of the season. And, you know, soon after that, I, I discovered JFK. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, so it, it became like this way of understanding. Everything I was doing kind of intuitively become more practical. Yeah. You know, I, I started to learn that, you know, that there is this other game that I, I was leaving so much of um, my game on the table because I didn't know how to access my mind and how to access all the things that was happening there. Right. Um, so it was amazing to kind of have literature and have teachers talking to you about Man, you know this is this is a natural part of it. You know the brain is this powerful thing, and if if it's um, if you use it, it can it can help you. So that was that was kind of an amazing thing for me because I think the first few years uh, in the NBA was was so difficult. I mean, we had we were losing a lot of games. I think I came out of uh, high school probably I lost maybe three games in my in my. <laughs> Did my three high school uh, in the three years of high school, and then I went into college. Into college, and we probably, you know, we lost some games, but we won the majority of our games. So we yeah. had about ninety percent. And then I came into the NBA, and I think we won like sixteen games out of eighty-two. And I was like, <laughs> "Oh my goodness, what is happening?" <laughs> but uh, I could really um, focus like uh, on performance. And not really start looking at the thing, and which was a very difficult thing to do. And I think um, JFK helped me a lot with that. Just like, how do you come out in a situation where it seems so bleak? And then how do you focus on your performance every day and not worry about the result, not worry about what's going to happen, mm -hmm. but to stay grounded in the moment? That was that was huge for me and, and, and very much needed. <laughs> yeah. So you started, um, I think you started at JFK mm -hmm. University right before I started there. Mm -hmm. Were you around 2000 or 99? So I think, yeah, I, um, I, so I came in in 97. I think I took oh, a okay. year to finish up. Um, when I, I was drafted in 97, I think it took a year. So I think it was in um, 98, 99. I graduated in 99. So I think right after that, okay. after my graduation. So I probably started about 2000 okay. in, uh, when we were in Orinda. Right. <laughs> right. And uh, it was just kind of like, that kind of journey of trying to figure out, you know, what is the mental side of sports and how do you approach that? And um, it was it was an interesting journey. Mm. So what have you, um, you know, it would have been really interesting to have a Donald's twin not do a degree in sports psychology <laughs> or your, your doppelganger or something. Cause, you know, because the inevitable question is, well, what what's different because of you, your degree? Right. Not only were you uh, playing at a very high level for a pro team, mm -hmm. you were also learning how all this stuff makes sense mm -hmm. and reading the books and doing the classes and, you know, we made you do internships <laughs> and, you know, you did everything that everybody else did. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess there's no way of knowing, like, how you would be different. Mm -hmm. But what are a few uh, key pieces that you took away and then, you use directly on the court 
So I was, you know, for the first, the first year, so I think it was a battle. Like I kind of theoretically knew what was that I needed to change something. So my first year, um, coming back from an injury, finishing up my undergraduate at, at, at Berkeley and um, really trying to figure out the next stage of my life. I, I, I dare say that I was at, at a point where I wasn't sure that my NBA career was going to go the way I thought it would. I thought that I, it would be very brief mm. um, because it was very tumultuous th those first two years. Um, and I think it was a, it was a good point because um, so I had like this idea. So I remember looking into sports psychology and and it, it was a gentleman that talked to me about it. And I remember starting to do research, but I didn't really understand um, the practical part of it. So the first two years, I think, in the league, it was kind of just figuring out how to handle all the stuff. So they, I kept, you know, the arousal stuff with the music and stuff. But it was more stuff like how do you um, play a game? My, I remember my grandmother died um, that raised me. Uh, I think it was my second year in the league. And I remember I just didn't know what to do. I mean, it, basketball seemed so you know, secondary, almost tertiary to the, to the reality. And I remember um, the team, we had so many um, players hurt and either we had to forfeit a game, uh, uh, it was that bad. And I just remember having to make this horrible decision of staying as opposed to going back, um, you know, to, to the funeral. And I remember thinking like, you know, as I was driving to the game, like, you know, this is this is crazy. This is like this is insane that the sport has, you know, rise to that level in my life and yet um I don't know if I can turn off like this emotion. I am I be, I was so emotional and I was so broken up yeah. and uh and I remember, you know, I got to the game and I'm trying everything to kind of distract myself from from, you know, what was going on and um it, it really, I just felt, I think at that moment that I wasn't sure that this was going to be the, the thing for me. I didn't think that professional basketball was a thing for me. And mm. it freaked me out um, because it was like so many things coming. We were losing. There was a lot of dysfunction in the team. Um, there was a lot of outside forces that were uh, protruding in into my play. Um, you know, I was dealing with family issues and, um, so it was, it was very, very difficult. So I, I dare say that those two years, um, was probably the lowest point of my career. And then I remember starting, um, you know, going into, uh, the GFK and talking about taking the class. And I think I started at my third year in the league. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember it was. I was afraid of it because mm. I didn't know like how to implement it because I was just starting with the introductory uh, class and I didn't want to just just ram everything into my game preparation and and change everything. Right. So so it, it took a little bit of time in trying to figure out like like implement a little piece and then uh, maybe okay. then a little piece right. and then see how it worked and then you know because it's like you've gotten to that point and then you know there's something missing missing but you don't want to just take all this new knowledge and just uh, put it into your sports yeah. because it's, it could be very confusing. Well, also yeah. you wouldn't, yeah, a good point. You wouldn't, it would be confusing. You also wouldn't know what you'd done to make the change because you changed everything. Right. So you'd be like, well, well what do I go back to? <laughs> exactly. So that, so, so I think that the first year was kind of more for under, general understanding, but keenly aware of more things that was going on and mm. some of the, the negative thoughts I had in my head. That was the first thing that I thought was huh. easy for me, you know, because I, I have this, uh, I was so competitive that I will really berate myself. Like, right. you know, I, and I was undersized. So every, every night it was, it was a very intense competition and yeah. I would, I, you know, caught myself like really being really mean to myself. What kind of <laughs> stuff would you say to yourself? Oh, really, really bad <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you stupid! What is wrong with you? You cannot play this sport. You dumb! Like yeah. I was really good at coming up with some good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Did you believe it? You know, it it was. Uh, I I I thought that you know it was a way of kind of 
shocking myself like mm. out of like mm-hmm. um either a, a space of being um not sufficiently aggressive mm-hmm. or acknowledging what was happening that i was getting killed um uh, in, the, in the context of the game so it was like i had to try to find a way to start changing um you know the the, the, the those kind of thoughts and yeah. really try to um convert them so i, I started okay you know what could you do? So, so instead of, instead of saying something negative, I would say something like, "Okay, cut him off earlier, meet him earlier, fight him earlier." Mm. You know, so it becomes almost very directive as like, "This is something you can do," rather than being uh, crippled by the situation that is right. happening. And it started working. And uh, <laughs> mm, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I'm wondering if the state, what you what you said uh, a couple of minutes ago, is the first step was to just become aware mm-hmm. of what you were doing. Right. Obviously you could have come aware, become aware anyway, right. but chances are you would have, you became aware a little bit quicker. Right. Um, because that's, that's the key. What we always say to a lot of people, mm-hmm. you know, to athletes and performers is how do you, how do you change something? Well, you have mm-hmm. to become aware first of mm-hmm. what it is that you're thinking and feeling so that your the way that you act and behave and perform ultimately can can change. So if you're not aware of that, it's hard to make a change. Yeah, and you know there there is this. Um, I I remember it's like you're in this in this pressure cooker, right? Mm. And it's like the awareness. Uh, the game itself. I think basketball is one of those games where you don't have. A lot of time in that three hour span you know it was it was hard to figure out like okay you know when are you gonna because you, you almost like in this like going down this hill like a hundred miles an hour and especially when you're when you're young athletes you don't realize like the time that you have moments in the game when you can take a breath it's like mm. I played a game like so recklessly yeah and I, I just remember it was I, it was like a, I was on a foul line and I, I was, you know, thinking about another play and what I was going to do next as the coach was calling out the play. And I just was like, this is a good time. You know, you could just take a breath, you know, and, and figure, you know, do a quick assessment of what's going on. You yeah. know, like, how, what could I do differently? So I started looking for situations in the game. The mm. game became less like 100 miles an hour. And I was able to take it down to about maybe 85, 90. Mm-hmm. So, and so I realized that I was much more effective because mm-hmm. I wasn't like out of control. So you start learning um, how to slow the game down mm-hmm. and moments, you know, in a timeout, uh, the coach was going to be talking, but there will be like a minute um, before the, the, the horn is sung that I can, you know, do a quick assessment of what's going on. Mm-hmm. So you start learning within it because before it used to be after the game, like, right. man, I can't believe I did that. I should yeah. have done this. You know, all well, your assessment was after, after the game, everything. after everything, yeah, which so is you like, couldn't change you can change it. Yeah. So you start, so that was, I think one of the biggest things is that that awareness led to looking for moments when I could, um, could break away and take a little bit of time, you know, yeah. for me and do qu- quick things, you know, am I nervous? Am I, really overplaying, you know, am I, am I playing to my strengths? What could I do different? So I start trying to figure out different things that I could adjust. So every, the game didn't become one. It became moments. It became like maybe a three minute moment, a break, a five minute moment, a break. And I start looking at those break as a way to assess and move forward, mm-hmm. how to, how to do things differently. And that helped my game quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's great. And then as you developed even more and you took more classes and like I said you know we we threw you into situations Mm -hmm. that um forced you to help others as well um was there anything else that you would say you noticed about your play changing or just the way you were thinking changing I think it was more of uh it was the shame factor Uh, sports is you know at that time Anything to do to mental health was very, you know, less than manly. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the biggest thing for me, you know, when uh, a player might ask, you know, what are you doing? Because I, I, I remember one time I went into the locker room and I literally, I'm 6'10", and I stuffed myself in my locker room, <laughs> in my locker. I literally, like, I was in my locker, coiled up, and, like... <laughs> And, you know, they're like walking by like, what the heck is going on? right? And I, I remember like, you know, 
you know, getting really excited. Okay, I'm going to tell them what I'm doing, you know, but then I'm like, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> not today. <laughs> not today. Maybe tomorrow. But it's like I started doing uh, different things. Like I would go off in a corner and uh, I'll take some moment to just kind of, uh, you know, mentally visualize what I was going to do. And, you know, it was like, I didn't want to say, like, I'm visualizing in the corner. <laughs> These are guys that I look up to. They're, the, you know, some of the greatest players. And I'm like, you know, I'm just going to keep this to myself. So I, I would say one of the biggest things was is when I started, like, talking about it. Yeah. Like, I mean, it would seem like a little thing, but just saying, you know, oh, I'm doing, like, you know, some visualization. And, you know, they kind of have that, like, uh-huh. What was their response? Were they it, skeptical or were they like, oh? Okay. I think that, you know, it was a combination. It was like, I think the first response was like, uh-huh. <laughs> like, the roll of the eyes, like... Yeah, mm -hmm. and they walk away. <laughs> and, you know, like there was like some of the younger guys who said, like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, and I was like, well, you know, like I'm thinking of this play. I played him already and I'm trying to figure out like, you know, things that he has done in the last game and how I could have responded differently. So mm -hmm. I'm putting myself in that situation, you know, like mm -hmm. to figure out how to play him. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm replaying a lot of his plays in my mind. And. You know, they were a little bit more curious about it. But then I, I, at the same time, I wasn't know if I was willing to share mm -hmm. beyond that, right, as to what it was. So I think that was a big thing yeah. for a while. Like, you know, it's like my little walk of shame. Right? Like, I have this thing that I learn and I'm proud of it, but I can't share it with anybody. <laughs> so did they know that you were a student? I think they might have, but I never really like overtly say it. Right. Um, because most of my schooling tend to be in the summer. So. Right. I never really kind of said, like, I always come back with something different at the end of the year, and they're just like, there, Donald, go again. <laughs> <laughs> there he goes again, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think that that was the, the, the big thing, was getting over the machismo of, like, uh, I've seen mental health as less than like uh, it, it made you less of an athlete yeah, that you, yeah. you know, so I think once I kind of let that go, then I started really noticing a really lot of stuff like, you know, I, I recover a lot better in terms of uh, mistakes. You know, I, I used to get so mad when I when I when I would make a mistakes. And, you know, part of it was just saying, you know, next play, next play, mm. next play. And that really helped me to always be ahead, you know. So I never let it, like, knock me down and out of the game. So I always, like, okay, you know, what could you do? What could you do next? What could you do next? So mm -hmm. I always, like... Always looking forward. Always looking forward. And that, that was... Uh, for basketball, especially the game changes so quickly, if you get that down, that's such a huge skill. Because, you know, you coach... You can see almost every player, whether they're in high school, college, or NBA, they make a mistake... And they like they almost pass for two seconds, and then by the time they turn around, they're the last one going off the floor, and the coach is screaming because they're not making that transition quickly enough. Yeah. And you know, so that became almost a, a, a skill in of itself, and that helped me. It helped my physical abilities because I was able to make a mistake and almost be the first one back down the floor to defend that mistake, and sometimes get a, a positive result because of it. So again, it keep reinforcing that mm. it was it was a good thing to do hmm. yeah I think that's uh, I think that's uh, that's really interesting I, I, I like the you know the way that you talk about basketball in terms of the the speed of it too mm -hmm. I think um, for those people who haven't been to a live basketball game I went to my first one a few years ago and whoo that thing I mean it moves really quickly and I'm I, I wasn't brought up with basketball mm -hmm. so uh, and then the the pomp and not the pomp and circumstance but you know all the hoopla that mm -hmm. goes around with it as well I think it is kind of over or it can be overwhelming yeah and you could see I mean the when you see a young player coming into the game I, I somebody asked me once they like do you remember the first game you play and I was like no <laughs> I'm like, I don't, I think they run over me on the floor. I think they literally run me over. I like, I don't remember anything because it was like, it was so bigger than me. It was right. uh, so yeah. fast. Yeah. And, it, you know, it was like, before I knew what happened, I was back on the bench um, because the game, I mean, 
and you see it a lot in young players is that they overplay the game. The game moves so fast that they almost it spins them around and they're really ineffective. And it usually takes them a while to kind of get ingrained and really get like seasoned into into the game. Because mm. as I say, you, you have... There is cheerleaders, there's 20,000 people, there is bands, there is yeah. people jumping, there is screaming, there is there's alcohol, music, there's, there's music, yeah, there is, like, I mean, a lot it's, it's, yeah. it's amazing. It's literally a three hour performance and like, you, there is something to distract you every time. I mean, you, you're you sitting there and you like, you look across and there's Jack Nicholson. Yeah, <laughs> you, you look across, there could be a famous person in the first row. I mean, it is like, we're we're athletes but we're still fans of other of other people so the people come in from football they come in from hockey they come in from acting and you like having to to compose yourself <laughs> right you like i remember one of my first time in la uh, I used to just love, and I'm looking, and I see Denzel, you know, oh, and yeah. sitting. I'm yeah. like, I want to run over and say hi. And I'm like, Are you go to New York, and Spike Lee is there, yeah. and he's talking to you. And I'm like, you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you kind of have that, like, that little kid. Like, I grew up watching yeah. these people, and like, how could I pretend that they're not there? <laughs> so I think that's that's one of the things that you see that players tend to naturally kind of evolve over time where they kind of let those things drop out and mm -hmm. really start focusing in on the game. Mm -hmm. And um, some do it naturally and some never really um, develop those skills. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I could talk to you for <laughs> eons and, I, you know, we've talked about a lot of stuff over the last few years. I wanted to just give you the opportunity to um, mention a, a little bit about your book because right. that's coming out soon. Yeah. Could you... Um, uh, could you say how this book started? <laughs> well, I have the most amazing professor yeah, ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did who, she make you who do? Who supervised my thesis <laughs> and taught me grounded theory. And, uh, and my topic for my thesis was, uh, I think, retirement experiences of NBA players. Yeah, and it was, and it was so interesting and at the time we said, you're going to make a book out of this because, mm -hmm. you know, it was so interesting in that it kept you going for quite a while. But also it's really important to re understand like, what happens mm -hmm. in retirement. And then you really started to focus more on the financial side. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I learned, I mean, overall, I learned a lot of things uh, within the context of really just talking to people. And I realized it was really an on top resources that we weren't going back and talking to the people that have lived the life that we're trying to change. And, mm. you know, so one of the things that happened is that while I was finishing up my, um, my, uh, my master's in sports psychology, I uh, also got a job in Orlando as director of player development. So um, I started learning that the kind of the most amazing people that can really help the next generation is the guys that have left the league because they know the mistakes that we've made and the mistakes they have made and they're able to help influence the next generation so i want you know i went back to my thesis and looked at it and one of the things that really jumped out was you know financial stuff like how um, how many of the players were broke at the end of the career so i wanted to go back and look at it and say okay what are some of the things that are happening across the board with, pe with athletes in terms of finances. You know, what is it about finances? You know, you make all this money. How could it be that you, you, you lose it at the end of your career when you most need it? Uh, what kind of things that they do? And I went back and started talking to players and it was amazing. They were, they were so giving in terms of talking about some of the mistakes they made. And mm -hmm. some of the mis mistakes were you thinking about a, a player coming in from you know, from a disenfranchised background, they, most of them are poor, they've never been around financial stuff. People take tremendous advantage of them. Mm -hmm. They have this guilt about helping families and the next generation and their friends, and they don't understand the limit of that. So mm -hmm. it, it, it was fascinating, and I just started writing, uh, writing about it, and um, I got to the point of publishing it, and then... Um, I think the day that I put it in on the um, on the internet and launched it, it got picked up by Harper Collins. So then we went back for two years, and finally, uh, the book is coming out in June, um, and we call in it "Winning the Money Game: Learning from the Falls of Professional Athletes." Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be a fascinating read for everybody 
who is interested in this topic and and not just people who are interested in basketball but mm -hmm. you know just the I, I think a lot of players should also be athletes of mm -hmm. at all in all different sports I think it's going to be some useful information in there as well. Yeah, what I wanted to do is not so much to focus on finance. I mean, it's a financial book, but I wanted to focus on the sociological and psychological aspects mm, of finance. Good. Because I think that, you know, it, everybody knows, you know, you can't spend all your money because you run out. I mean, it, right. it's a fact that everybody knows. But the question is, you know, why do you do some of the things that you do? And it's, it, it goes beyond, I think, the athlete. It goes beyond, I think, it's more about people in general. I yeah. mean, we have a, a culture in the United States where a lot of people spend the entire career and the entire life in debt. Uh, and then the question becomes is like nobody writes about them because the fall from grace is not as, as huge. But if you're, you know, going out on a Friday and spending all the money that you have for food for the week, I mean, it's, it's no different. It's just not going to be in the papers. But athletes, they make so much money, but they make it in such a limited time. Right. So they have four years. Uh, 3.7 years to make as much money and then they have to live their life. So their career could potentially be over by the time they're 23. <laughs> I mean, wow. so, so I think you can understand when you think of it in that and now you have to figure out and have the discipline to live a life hopefully until you're 110. <laughs> is, that, is that how long you're going to live? That's how long I'm going to nice. live. <laughs> you might need new knees before and Definitely then. new knees. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sure that your book is going to do really well, and uh, I wish you all the best with that. Um, so, as the sun keeps shining uh, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, hopefully the sun is shining where people are listening to this, and if not, we're bringing a sunny moment to them, I think. Yes, we are. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're here in O'Donnell's house. We're having a lovely um, time just relaxing, and... There's one last question before we wrap up mm -hmm. that I have been asking everybody. If you knew you couldn't fail, what would you do tomorrow? Wow, that's, that's an amazing question. Um, I think that I would like to go to the moon. Whoa. <laughs> I remember, like, uh, what, as a student of history, I always think about the extraordinary view that you get looking back from the moon to where we are. Right. You know, and I, yeah. I just, I think it's it's that idea that we tend to think of ourselves as bigger than we are. And I think that it's a humbling thing to see that at the end of the day that, you know, it's your vision and what you have to change the world that should be brilliant and big. Um, as individual, we just try to figure out how to get from day to day, but it's the vision that is amazing. And I think what a bold vision it was to say, let's go to the moon. Let's yeah. let's go to the moon and and, uh, and to take that view backwards. I just, I just can't imagine just being on the moon and looking back at what we consider, you know, our civilization. Ours, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is amazing, isn't it? When you think about it like that. Yeah, it's incredible. So that's what I Okay, mean. that's what I would do. All right, that's a good, good answer. Well, it has been a pure pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, being part of WeChat. So tune in, everybody, to hear who we have next time on WeChats with Brilliant People. Mm.